Uh, we now move on to the next talk, a very interesting molecule again being talked about so much. And uh, the topic is dapagliflozin, preventing the progression of cardiorenal metabolic complications. And for this, we have Dr. Gagan Priya with us, who is going to deliver this talk. Uh, she is an endocrinologist, a senior consultant endocrinologist at the Fortis and IV Hospitals, Mohali. Uh, she has also been SCOPE certified by the World Obesity Federation and has had the IGEM Award for Best Review Article in 2018. She has been an editor of, book, uh, of the book Lipochronology, Glucochronology and Hypothyroid Disorders and is a section editor for another uh, book called Urcha and uh, over 65 publications, book chapters, and she has been uh, the founder president of FLAME, which is Forum of Ladies in Medicine, and has also been the ambassador from India for diabetes. So over to you, Dr. Gagan Priya. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nita, for this uh, kind words of introduction. And uh, thanks to the organizers of IDEC for inviting me uh, for this and Intas for you know, sponsoring this session. So what we'll talk of here is basic science, evidence-based medicine. And uh, what I would like to cover in the next few minutes is the science behind dapagliflozin. We saw it as a molecule that began with, you know, just management of diabetes. And honestly, when this molecule came into the market, all of us were skeptical using a drug that caused glucosuria, the very symptom that we were trying to prevent. But now we know that these are game changer molecules, SGLT2 inhibitors, and this is what I would say up front, because this is very true for diabetes care. We were born not knowing anything about diabetes. And in the past, you know, almost a century, ever since the discovery of insulin, we've had very little time to change that here and there. But we have made some seminal changes. What we do understand now, diabetes is not just a progression of beta cell dysfunction in the face of insulin resistance. There are also so many factors things that pathophysiologies that are going across a continuum, right from accumulation of cardiometabolic renal risk factors and development of target organ damage, including cardiovascular, vasculature, CKD, and other uh, organs, including liver, obstructive sleep apnea, etc., and further on into target organ damage where the patient becomes symptomatic and reaches end-stage disease. So the aim of treatment for such a disease, a multi-system disease, should also be multi-systematic and that should include cardiometabolic and renal care. So it is no longer just effective sustained glycemic control. It also includes low risk of hypoglycemia and reduced uh, risk of weight gain or promotion of weight loss. But we also have to focus on reduction of cardiovascular risk, including heart failure and renal comorbidities, as well as ensure the patient remains on the same track that we do as clinicians. Now, if I were to tell you that there is a single drug that can do all of these, I would be what this person here is, and that's a quack. There is no single drug, so it's a combination of treatments we'll be looking at, but today we'll focus on dapagliflozin. So we'll take quickly three case scenarios, an elderly gentleman with 10 to 15 years of diabetes, established coronary artery disease, low ejection fraction, and stage 3 CKD. A young lady who's, this patient is at the end of the spectrum, a middle-aged lady who has 10, 7 to 10 years of diabetes and hypertension, who has uncontrolled diabetes, LVH and microalbuminuria. And then we look at a patient who is in early in the spectrum here, a 34-year male with one year of diabetes history uncontrolled, but struggling with obesity and NFLD, obstructive sleep apnea, etc. So let's look at the very first patient. An elderly gentleman with 10 years of diabetes on metformin had a recent acute coronary syndrome, has undergone a PTCA, but has reduced ejection fraction. A1C is 8.3, creatinine is 1.7. So stage 3, BCKD and neurin albumin creatinine ratio is macro range. So what are the needs of this patient? He needs good glycemic control and low risk of hypoglycemia. He also needs reduction in cardiovascular and heart failure risk, which he clearly is at risk of and we also need to have therapies to prevent the progression of nephropathy. So let's look at the evidence with SGLT2 inhibitors. 
we do know patients with established AS CVD. We have had three large CV outcome studies, EMPA-REG, Canvas, Declare, and Invertus also is there in this entire group. And what you can clearly see is that patients with established AS CVD, there is a clear reduction of MACE events with SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, the study population in each of these trials was different, but eventually this is what you get at. What about hospitalization for heart failure? You see a very, very significant benefit in patients who have established ASCVD, and that's where the risk reduction lies. So you do have benefits in terms of hospitalization for heart failure. What about cardiovascular deaths? There's only one study, EMPA-REG, which has shown a clear reduction in cardiovascular deaths. Declare was a mixed population, so you're not really finding that signal. And we cannot emphatically say that, yes, dapagliflozin also reduces CV death because we don't have that evidence in this kind of a patient scenario. More recently, we've had very revolutionizing results from the DAPA-HF trial, which was a trial of about 4,700 patients with NYHA 2 to 4 heart failure with ejection fraction of less than 40%. And these patients had diabetes in 45%, but 55% of this population did not have diabetes. So what was seen after a median follow-up of about 18 months, there was a substantial 26% relative risk reduction in the composite of cardiovascular death and worsening of heart failure. And you see the same kind of evidence, 30% reduction in hospitalization for heart failure, as well as reduction in cardiovascular death. So yes, in this patient scenario, now we do have the data both first and recurrent hospitalization for heart failure, all cause mortality, et cetera, were reduced. And what was the number needed to treat one event, that uh, to prevent one event was just 21. If you go back to statin trials or trials of ACE inhibitors, et cetera, the numbers needed to treat actually much higher, 30, 40 for each of these drugs. What about the effect on atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter? We have the sub-analysis from the clear to me showing significant reduction in the risk of first atrial fib fibrillation of flutter as well as recurrent events. And the benefits last, the same kind of benefit persists whether or not patient has ASCVD or risk factor heart failure or no heart failure or prior AF or no AF. What about the renal outcomes, which is another point of concern for us. Again, throughout all the major CVOTs of the SGLT2s, you can see one clear benefit, irrespective of baseline EGFR, you have a substantial reduction in hard renal endpoints. Mind you, these were not just, you know, prevention of albuminuria or regression of albuminuria. These endpoints were something like doubling of serum creatinine or reduction of EGFR by more than 40-50% or the need for dialysis. However, one can argue that the renal events numbers were not very significant in these CVOTs and they were not designed to actually assess renal outcomes. So more recently, we have the CREDENCE trial with canagliflozin showing very impressive studies uh, data. And now we have the DAPA-CKD. Another interesting study, which took about another 4,300 participants, and the EGFR categories used were from 25 to 75 in the DAPA-CKD. About two-thirds of these patients roughly had diabetes. The others were non-diabetic chronic kidney disease. They did take patients with albuminuria only. So 200 to 5,000 was the albumin creatinine ratio being taken. And again, you can see almost a 39% reduction in the primary composite endpoint, which was doubling of creatinine, need for renal replacement therapy, renal death, or cardiovascular death. Renal specific endpoints also, you can see significant reduction benefits in terms of reduction for hospitalization for heart failure persist, and they're quite impressive here. And the death from any cause, all cause mortality is significantly reduced. Like all, all other uh, SGLT2 inhibitors, what is seen as very classically with dapagliflozin also in this trial was what is called as the check mark sign. Nephrologists now call this check mark sign that possibly this is an indication that the drug is actually correcting hyperfiltration. So the initial small decline in EGFR of about three to five indicates that there was hyperfiltration in the pathophysiology 
and the SGLT2 inhibitor is being shown to correct that. This check mark sign is also very typical of the other drugs which correct hyperfiltration, and that is the RAS blockers. So you see initial small decline, but thereafter the decline actually slows down compared to the placebo group with actually a small advantage in the end that the slope of EGFR decline actually is slower. So if you look at dapagliflozin, now we have evidence for heart failure, for CKD, even outside of diabetes scenario. We do have primary renal outcome and heart failure data. So that means possibly this patient, let's look again, does dapagliflozin offer improved glycemic control? We've heard a beautiful talk from Dr. Shashang Joshi earlier, and yes, it does. Reduction of cardiovascular and heart failure risk? Yes. Reduction of renal risk? Yes. So in this particular patient scenario, Yes, these class of drugs do offer the hope of cardiorenal protection. What about our second patient, a middle-aged lady, BMI 29? Uh, she's on metformin and glimepiride, and she's complaining of hypoglycemias with just one milligram glimepiride. She also has LV hypertrophy. She has an EGFR, which is relatively good, but a UACR of 265. So what are the needs of this patient? In addition to good glycemic control, low risk of hypoglycemia. So this drug needs to be taken off here. She needs weight reduction. She needs regression of albuminuria and reduction of cardiovascular risk because she's already having cardiovascular risk factors like LV hypertrophy and microalbuminuria. Now, we have in the first part of this talk looked at this category of patients who had established ASCVD, but what about where our patient falls in is in this category. So, declared to me was one of the studies which included 60% population like our patient, so they had multiple risk factors. Canvas also had 35% of patient population with multiple risk factors. And these were, on, from the renal standpoint, relatively healthy EGFRs were quite good for these patients. So let's look at the bottom panel of this uh, table. So patients with multiple risk factors, what does dapagliflozin offer us? It offers reduction in hospitalization for heart failure. Definitely we see that. What about the renal composite endpoints? Does it give us benefit in terms of that? Yes, we can clearly see that there is a clear reduction in renal endpoints, even in patients with multiple risk factors and no ASCVD, no CKD. What about this figure? We've been talking about this on and on. So we do know that patients with prior MI or established ASCVD, you do get with SGLT2 inhibitors, very good reduction in MACE events. And you don't have too much data for patients with multiple risk factors. But what about the composite of cardiovascular death and hospitalization for heart failure, the benefits and the renal outcome benefits, they persist throughout the continuum. So we do have clear evidence for this category of patients, as well as this category of patients, as to what benefits to expect. Now, looking at the standards of medical care of ADA, and of course, the other guidelines say the same thing now, that patients who are having established ASCVD or risk factors, we should be considering drugs with proven cardiovascular benefit, and these include SGLT2 inhibitors or GLP-1 RA, and the same goes particularly if there is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, because we have DAPA-HF study clearly showing benefits, SGLT2 inhibitors are the first choice drugs, and they should be considered even on the background of metformin use or irrespective of metformin use at whatever A1C the patient is having. And more recently, the Emperor Preserve study has also shown that these benefits possibly also extend to patients with preserved ejection fraction, not just HEF-REF, but also HEF-PEF. And also in CKD, we do have data as of now only for patients with kidney disease and albuminuria, because our trials were looking at that kind of a patient population. So SGLT2 inhibitors are the front indications for that category of patients. We will have data of EMPA kidney coming in a couple of years that is also looking at a subcategory of patients who have non-albuminuric chronic kidney disease. So SGLT2 inhibitors, 
should be recommended independent of glycemic control in patients at with CVD or at risk factors for CVD and DKD with albuminuria. So does this patient, you know, benefit from dapagliflozin? Again, asking the same question. Yes, it offers improved glycemic control. It reduces the risk of hypoglycemia. Weight reduction is there. And there is regression of albuminuria and cardiovascular risk, particularly with regards to the risk of hospitalization for heart failure. Now, looking at the third and last patient, which I'll go through quickly, a young male with one-year history of diabetes, BMI 27.5, has A1C of 7.8, has non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and obstructive sleep apnea. At present, his renal functions are normal, albuminuria is not there, hypertension is well controlled, and you don't see LP hypertrophy. So what do we need for this patient? We need early intensive control, hit early, hit hard to make sure the risk factor accumulation does not happen. We do need reduction in adiposity, adiposity-related comorbidities, which are present in this patient. And what if we can reduce long-term complication risk? So this is a very common uh, saying, you know, prevention is better than cure. So true prevention is not waiting for the accumulation of risk factors, but actually preventing things from happening in the first place. So looking at, in one nutshell, what dapagliflozin offers, it offers early intensive glycemic control with very low risk of hypoglycemia. Higher the baseline A1C, greater is the HPA1C reduction. Whether it is in monotherapy, it's an add-on to one or two drugs or add-on to insulin. Also, these glycemic lowering efficacy is persistent throughout. It does offer about two to three kgs of weight reduction. Unfortunately, it does not go beyond that. So where weight reduction is a major, major priority, possibly GLP-1 RAs would have a clear edge there. But that two to three kg is important for us. It does offer reduction in hypertension, so systolic and diastolic blood pressure reduction. And more recent studies have also shown that there is a better, you know, 24 hour BP profile in the terms of nocturnal hypertension is taken care of well with SGLT2 inhibitors. We've already heard Dr. Shashank earlier about the effect on body weight, and you can see that all indices of adiposity would be improved, it, whether it be the body fat distribution, visceral fat, the uh, uh, inflammatory markers from the fat, they would be reduced, pro -inflammatory, uh, the pro-inflammatory markers would be reduced and anti-inflammatory markers would actually increase. What about effect on NAFLD? Again, this is currently possibly just a hypothesis as of now. We do have some proof of concept studies in patients with NAFLD that SGLT2 inhibitors might actually be helpful in reducing the intrahepatic fat content. And there might be a beneficial effect on liver enzymes, on insulin sensitivity, possibly directly because of weight loss as well as lipolysis. However, these are proof of concept studies and we need more data. We do have with empagliflozin the e-lift study from Medanta, which was an interesting paper in itself, but we also need biopsy-driven studies to really show the impact of uh, SGLT2 inhibitors on na NAFLD or NASH-related cirrhosis. What about obstructive sleep apnea? Again, another proof of concept study in a small number of patients wherein it showed a reduction not just in body weight, A1C, and lipid parameters. There was a reduction in apnea, hypopnea uh, index. There was an improvement in hypoxemia that was occurring during sleep, in the snoring frequency, and the, there was a decrease in the, uh, the ESS scoring for the obstructive sleep apnea. So definitely, again, an area that needs further evaluation. So for this patient, what we can clearly say, it offers us the chance of early intensive control and weight reduction and a possible reduction in risk of comorbidities. And uh, we, we can't really say that, yes, 20 years down the line, we will see a clear reduction in MACE events, but that's where we are. Very interestingly, SGLT2 inhibitors, our understanding of these drugs has gone, undergone a C change as just molecules which cause glucosuria. So we thought it's just a drug that reduces the uh, blood glucose by flushing it out into the urine. But we now also understand natriuresis is a very important component of its action. In the renal uh, tissue, there is also increased erythropoietin and increased hematocrit. There is a blockage of the sodium hydrogen exchanger NHE3 both in the renal tubule and NHE1 in the myocardium. 
there seem to be multiple mechanisms of action, plus, of course, anti-inflammatory effects, anti-fibrotic effects, and a clear reduction in plasma volume. There in the renal tubule, a very clear benefit, which drives possibly the renal benefits, in addition to all the other mechanisms, is restoration of tubular glomerular feedback, which reduces glomerular hyperfiltration, reduction in sympathetic tone, improvement in endothelial function, etc. So where not to use, of course, we have to remember acute hyperglycemia, osmotic symptoms or catabolic features, medical or surgical acute illness, active or recent UTI and recurrent genital mycotic infections, which are hard to manage. And we should be cautious about certain signals like significant risk of UTI, prior amputation of peripheral vascular disease or significant foot ulcer. And patients on multiple diuretics, we might just want to be cautious with the doses of loop diuretics. So I'll conclude here. There's a Chinese proverb that says, the inferior doctor treats actual sickness. The mediocre doctor attends to impending sickness and superior doctor prevents sickness. But I think what we need to understand is the balance patient-centered doctor takes care of all three. So I'll conclude here and thank you so much. Thank you so much, Gaganpriya. Your last slide was indeed uh, very, very fascinating and that is so much the truth. Thank you so much for taking us to dapagliflozin as a molecule that uh, prevents the progression of cardiorenal uh, metabolic complications. I do not see any questions in the chat box. Uh, thank you very much for a very illuminating lecture. And thanks for being a part of IDEC. Thanks, my pleasure.